Good morning. Good morning and welcome to the 1002 service at the Union Church of South Foxborough. Good morning to all of you who are watching on live stream. It's great to have you joining us. Judy, good morning in Wisconsin. Wayne and Judy, here are my boots. I hope you can see them. They were a gift from Wayne and Judy. Wayne and the boys are running a little late, but welcome, Judy, and to everyone else who's watching. We are grateful for every one of you. God is wherever we are. Any, any day, any time, God's in that room, don't worry. If you're watching on live stream, there was just a crash in the room beside me. I'm going to open us in prayer, and we're going to um, then share a few announcements, and then we will begin our worship. But Heavenly Father, thank you for every person here every person who was watching. Thank you for your kindness, your grace, your concern and love for each and every one of us. Bless our service today, we pray, by your presence. Receive our gratitude and our worship, and we give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Just a couple announcements to share with you that are you've probably already seen on the wall behind me, but good morning, welcome. Trustees and Finance Committee are meeting on Tuesday, January 10. Trustees at 6 p.m., Finance at 6.30 p.m. Come on in. You are invited to either of those. All our meetings are public, unless stated otherwise, which is very rare. So Trustees and Finance are 6 and 6.30 on Tuesday night. We are updating our church directory. There's probably a QR code on the wall behind me right now, right? And you can use your phone to go online and do the form through the QR code, or you can do it the old-fashioned way with the paper that is in your bulletin, and the highest authority in our church would like you to do this, my wife. So the, even if we already have your information, we'd like to make sure it's up-to-date and correct, so... If you could fill that out, it would be very much appreciated. Thursday night, there's a terrific event here at Union Church. Women's Bible Study is meeting Thursday, January 12, at 7 p.m. We now have chairs here so the ladies can uh, make a circle and, and meet together and use this part of the building more easily. But when is that? That's Women's Bible Study. All women are invited. Thursday, January 12th, that's this coming Thursday at 7 p.m. Lastly, uh, Soup Sunday is something we've done in the past. If you've been here a while, you may recall us getting together after this service, the whole church family, 8 and 10 o'clock services invited. We're doing that again on January 29 from 11.30 to 1.00. You are invited to come 11.30 to 1 o'clock. We're going to share a meal together, and we're also going to talk about our, our year together. And what, Good morning. Good morning, you guys. Um, what we're going to be thinking about and praying for in the new year, so that's Soup Sunday, lunch together, January 29, 11.30. By the way, if you've never been to one, we have amazing cooks. Good morning. Good morning, you guys. We have amazing cooks in this church. Come hungry. You won't regret it. I believe now we're going to shift gears and worship the God who made all things and who knows our name. Shall we stand to worship together?
in kindergarten through fifth grade and you wish to go to Children's Church, you can go at this time with Ms. Tammy. Bye, Daisy. I like Daisy more than she likes me, I can tell. As part of our worship, we always take a moment to pray for some of the requests that are on the hearts of people. By the way, I have a praise. I'm happy that Dave White is back with us today. He's a great part of our worship team. And <laughs> had a little injury that sidelined him, but we're happy to have him back with us today. So grateful for that. And I have some prayer requests to add to our list. Um, one is another praise. If you were in 8 o'clock service, you got the whole deal and you got to see the ring. But Jason and Elizabeth have gotten engaged. Jason gets double credit, his second service today. So we are happy and we will pray for them and for their future together. Um, Estella just shared a prayer request with me for her niece, Cheryl Diamond who has had a baby but is not doing well in her recovery from delivery. So we will pray for Cheryl. Also at the, at the 8 o'clock service, there's a guy, 31 years old, big, strong-looking guy named Ryan, who texted me last night and said, I'm in ter his te chronic back pain, chronic back pain, really debilitating, and he asked for prayer, so we're going to pray for Ryan as well this morning. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She, she shall not break. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in an uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much. Thank you so very much that we too can say, we choose you. You are our strength and our refuge. You are our help in trouble. You are our fortress. And though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, we trust in you. You will not fall. You will not fail. You are the one we come to when all our life is in an uproar. You are with us. And we will trust you. And because we do, we will see the works of the Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are wiser beyond any human ability to understand. Thank you that you are greater and more noble in character than any human being. Thank you that you are beyond our understanding, and yet you bend low to establish a relationship. And you have given your Son, Jesus Christ, sent by the Father and the Holy Spirit as the Redeemer of all who will look to him by faith, who will see him and humble their hearts and be forgiven. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you that we may look to you and never be disappointed. And Heavenly Father, we bring before you some of the many prayer requests that we have on our hearts this morning, and there are so many, and each one is important. Thank you for Jason and Elizabeth. 
Thank you that you brought them from hundreds of miles apart together in their life. And Heavenly Father, we hold them before you as they take this commitment to one another before you. We ask that you would bless them. We ask that you would go before them into the future and prepare the way for them. We pray that you would allow them to follow you together step by step in all that you would have them do. We pray for Cheryl Diamond this morning, Estella's niece. You know exactly what is happening with her. We pray for healing. We pray for wholeness. We pray for recovery for her. We pray for Ryan who is struggling with terrible pain. Father, be with him and continue to bless him. And Father, in some way we pray, remove this from him. Grant him comfort. We think of Mickey Carl this morning who is undergoing chemotherapy and pray that it would be effective for her health and well-being and a restoration of her health and her vigor. Thank you for Ted McIntosh. Thank you that he's working hard to the point of fatigue in his rehabilitation. Bless it to him. Bless him mightily, we pray today. For Carol Gorney, we continue to pray as, as doctors search for what exactly to do to help her. Grant them wisdom and grant Carol relief and recovery and strength and energy. Continue to be with Ellen Chapman being treated for cancer, for Peg Mossman who is at a delicate stage of life, for Gail French recovering in her facility, we ask your blessing. Father, for those in at the Sober House, we have adopted Roads to Recovery and others who are seeking recovery from various forms of addiction. Heavenly Father, do a mighty work in this community and among our friends and family members and our own lives who struggle with this. Father, grant health, grant hope, grant wise choices. We hold our nation before you today. We are a nation in great need. Grant our leaders wisdom beyond what they are capable of. And Father, may you do a spiritual work in our country. Humble us. Bring us together before your throne. Help us, Heavenly Father, we pray to acknowledge you and all of who you are. And Father, we worship you together by praying as our Master Jesus has taught us to pray, whose Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite Kevin Gorney to come up and lead us in prayer for our offering. Good morning, church. What a glorious day indeed here at, at Union Church. It's great to see that sun beaming through. Our offering scripture today is Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. 
Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be in your presence today. We are so grateful for your love, your mercy, your grace, and the many gifts you have granted us. As recipients of this abundant life you have provided through your Son, our Savior, we now present our offering to both honor and glorify you. We know, Heavenly Father, that we could never repay you for all that you've furnished us. Still, we cheerfully give you your portion as you have guided us with our thanks for your never-ending faithfulness. And we do so in your Son, Jesus' precious name. Thank you, Kevin, for taking that moment to give thanks with us and offer our worship to God and our offering. We're going to be looking today, if you want to plan ahead, we're going to look at just one verse in the book of Hebrews, verse 7, but we're also going to be considering Genesis chapter 6, if you want to put a finger in that. Genesis is at the very beginning of the Bible, the passage in Hebrews, if you're using a Bible there in a chair is on page 851. We're going to be thinking about Noah today. But I'm thinking of someone else right now who had a nasty habit. He had a nasty habit of standing on principle instead of going along with his political party. He was an ambassador to Russia when he was only in his early 20s, so he had a great deal of experience when he was already a United States senator in his 30s, but he, he didn't go along with his political party, so he lost his Senate seat. He was appointed Secretary of State and then elected president. He lost the popular vote, but he, w he was elected president. But again, as president, he kept standing on principle and defying the other party and his own party, so when he ran for re-election, he lost in a landslide. His fellow citizens then came to him and said, we'd like you to represent us in the U.S. House of Representatives. He reluctantly agreed to have his name put up if he didn't have to campaign. He won the election, and the man I'm thinking of became the greatest voice in U.S. history for the abolishment of slavery, longer than Abraham Lincoln, longer and louder than any other voice in American history. He spoke up for the abolishment of slavery, and he was viewed as a guy standing on principle, but not going along with his own party or the other. He began presenting anti-slavery petitions for the U.S. House of Representatives in his time to consider one was from the voters of his own district. Another was from Quakers across the United States. Another was from school children in the northern states he presented before the House of Representatives. He really infuriated some segments of society when he presented a petition from slaves sarcastically thanking their owners for keeping them as slaves on the floor of the U.S. House. He was hated for standing on principle. He stood out like the proverbial sore thumb, like no one else, standing on principle, refusing to just go along, even, even with his own party. Finally, at the age of 83, still striving for the abolishment of slavery, he had a stroke on the floor of the old U.S. House of Representatives chamber. You can go and stand in the very spot. There's a plaque marking where he fell. He was carried off the chamber to a side room where he stayed on a couch and died two days later. Historians agree that the principles of our sixth president, John Quincy Adams, and his standing out for what was right have stood well the test of time. Well, so is the case of the man we're going to think about today and his faith, and he stood out, if anything, far more radically than 
John Quincy Adams in his time, and the man that we're going to think about today is in Hebrews 11, verse 7, and you know his name, and you know what he did, and his name is Noah. And Noah's radical approach to his faith and what it drove him to do made him stand out so radically he was the only man on the face of the earth who stood out in the way that he did, and it led him to do things that probably, although scripture never states it, probably led him to be ridiculed in his time, but it stood well the test of time. And so Noah is included in the Hebrews Faith Hall of Fame that we're walking through in our study of the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews is writing for a first century Jewish audience, Jewish slash Christian audience, which has suffered persecution, scattered over the Roman Empire, who are looking for some reason in their dire circumstances to trust in Christ. And the author of Hebrews reaches back into the Old Testament and Jewish history to say, here are some examples of people who suffered and struggled or stood out in radical ways because of their faith to strengthen the people of that day, and the people of our day. We, too, going through difficult times, and we go through things we never expected in this life. But when we go through difficult times, we can say, Noah made it, Abraham made it, Moses made it, Rahab was forgiven, and she made it. So to encourage persecuted believers to trust in Christ, we're going to think about Noah today, who the author holds up as a hero of the Hebrew past in the Old Testament. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, says this. By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. But I've asked Danny also to read the story of Noah from Genesis chapter 6, beginning at verse 8 for us this morning. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an open opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring flood waters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him.
Thank you, Danny. And my apologies, Dave. It's only six feet wide here. That's evidently not wide enough for me to get through. But thank you for reading that, Danny. The story of Noah, who is a hero of the faith, is an encouragement to Christians, what followers of Christ, whatever century that we live in. And looking at these passages, we see some things about Noah that are included in Hebrews and why the author included Noah in the Hebrews Faith Hall of Fame. And the first thing we notice is Noah believed God for the impossible. He believed what God said for the impossible. Do you have anything, have you ever had an impossible thing in your life or you have one now? Hebrews, or Genesis rather, 6 verse 8 tells us Noah found favor with God. He was a righteous man, blameless in his time, not meaning he was morally perfect, but meaning that he walked closely with God and because of his faith in God was a forgiven man seeking to live his life as best he could in obedience before God. Noah had a humble heart. Noah didn't know it all. He had a teachable spirit. He didn't try to impress others with his spirituality, though it ended up having him stand out because of his faith principles, but he walked with God in his own life. He walked with God where God had placed him to live his life. And God, in turn, confides in Noah because of their close relationship, something shocking, and it's shocking to this day. I am going to judge the sin of humanity, God said. I'm going to wipe out humanity with water, and I'm going to start all over again. I'm going to start again with you and your family, Noah. I will spare no one else. So I want you to build a boat. I want you, Noah, to build a boat. Now imagine what people would say if you built the following boat, you and I, we built the following boat in our backyard. The ark was 450 feet long, a football field and a half. It was over three stories tall, 48 feet. It was 80 feet wide all along the majority of it. It had 100,000 square feet of storage capacity on its various floors, a total of 100,000 feet. Those who are better at math than myself have calculated that it held the equivalent of 570 railroad boxcars worth of cargo. 570 railroad car loads could fit within Noah's Ark. It would have taken decades to build. It was in an arid area of the world, a dry area. He would have gathered all the wood he could get year after year from far ex places at a huge personal expense to build a boat that there was absolutely no apparent use or need for on his property. And there's nothing in the scripture, although it's often portrayed in, in cartoon form or movie form that Noah was ridiculed. There's nothing in the scripture that actually says he was ridiculed. The apostle Peter seems to refer to that type of thing when he, in 2 Peter chapter 2, mentions that Lot was tormented by the people of his day. Noah, no doubt as well, was tormented by the unrighteousness of the time in which he lived and probably was ridiculed for what he was doing. And by the way, as a historical tangent, so you have it, you have it in your mind, I learned it too, Noah overlapped in lifespan with Lot and with Abraham. Noah lived until Abraham was 58 years old. Jewish ancient tradition, ancient Jewish tradition says that Noah was a mentor to Abraham and taught him for 39 years before Noah passed away. Noah was Abraham's great, 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 great grandfather. And so that's what Jewish tradition says. Scripture doesn't say it. But all of that is aside anyway from the very stark fact 
that Noah believed God over every other data source, every other opinion, even common sense and logic. Noah believed God and did an irrational thing, and I'm not advising anyone to do the irrational, but he believed God over any other when God said in this arid place, I am going to bring judgment on the world, and I want you, Noah, to build a 450 foot long, 48 foot high, 80 foot wide boat, because I am bringing judgment on the face of the earth. Noah believed God. Noah believed God for the impossible. If we have the impossible in our life, if we're a first century Jewish Christian being persecuted and it's impossible to hang on to our faith, we can believe God for the impossible. If we look at our present circumstances or a relationship in our life that's broken or our future, and if you're like me, you're always concerned about what does the future hold? What will become of me? What will become of the people I love? We can trust God with the impossible. We can trust God when it doesn't make sense because Noah, Noah's task did not make any sense to any rational person. We can trust God when we don't understand and we experience things as we go through life that we don't understand. Why did this person do this to me? Why has my life turned out in this way? Why did I lose this job I so loved? Or whatever it might be, we can trust God when it doesn't make sense, when the geography doesn't make sense, when all of our reference points seem to be gone and faulty. We can be like Noah, who believed God even when it was impossible. He believed God for what was not possible. Maybe God said to Noah, I know you don't understand. I know you don't know why I'm doing this. I know your eyes don't see what I'm about to do, but you can trust in me. I can see the future. I can see what should happen. I know a PhD who was told the following, you will never amount to anything. Maybe you've heard voices in your life and you have them in your head living on from when you were a child or whatever it might be saying you will never amount to anything. You're a failure in life. Nobody cares about you. Maybe you have those lies in your head. We can trust in God who says, I love you. I value you. I sent my son to die on the cross for you. That's how much I care about you. You can believe in me. We can believe God for what may or may not make sense, what the world will never say to us, what other voices do not encourage us with. We can trust in God, and as Noah did, believe God for the impossible and believe God for what he said. I went to the garage recently to leave a car to get my amazing 300,000 mile Honda to get brand new tires on it. And there was a brand new employee sitting in the chair with the boss right there with her. And the boss was showing her what her job was. So I walked in and the boss said to her, say hi. She said hi. I said, here are my keys. She shyly reached out and took my keys. I said, I can give you money toward the tires now. I gave some money. The boss said, take the money. She smiled and took the money. And the boss said, now tell him thank you. She said, thank you. She was the cutest girl that's ever waited on me in any garage. I said, how old are you? She said, tree. <laughs> the boss's three-year-old daughter, little Fiona, diligently listening to her father, believing what he said, learning what her task was. We can listen to our Father in heaven. We can listen when he speaks through the scripture to us. We can learn our task. And Noah listened. Noah believed God for what was impossible. And because he did what we did, we have a wonderful symbol and a great story to learn, learn about. But we have the ark. Noah built the ark. Do you know what the ark was? It was a wooden instrument representing salvation. 
who would be rescued from a universal flood? Noah and his family. We're told in Genesis chapter 6 in the early verses that God, who is holy, loving, gracious, kind, looked at humanity who were living on the beautiful world that he had made, and the, every inclination of their hearts was evil in every sense. And God could not tolerate allowing this to continue. It grieved his heart, and it was not best for humanity. So God decided to judge universally all the world humanity, and he revealed to Noah his intention to hold a universal judgment over all the world consisting of the great flood, and we're told how God's heart was deeply grieved because he had lovingly created humanity in his own image and likeness. One man on the face of the earth was listening to God. One man was forgiven because of faith in God. One man was therefore considered blameless in walking and in relationship with God. And God, who brought a universal judgment on all humanity, spared one man and through one man spared a remnant of humanity to continue where all descendants of Noah and his family. God brought about a miracle so that humanity would begin again and said to Noah, you believe in me, therefore you are blameless, you are forgiven, and therefore you will escape the judgment I am bringing. And the pattern is established and it continues through the Old Testament and into the New. One righteous man, one man who believed God and walked with him and lived blamelessly, an instrument of wood, the ark, which became the instrument of salvation, deliverance from a universal judgment that God was bringing upon humanity. And we see the pattern repeated. Later, Moses and Aaron have a, Aaron has a wooden staff that he does miracles by and holds out and the Red Sea parts and the people cross across and they are delivered from bondage, from slavery in Egypt. We see later the wood, we see also the, the blood sprinkled on the wooden doorpost, an instrument of wood, and when the blood was sprinkled on the doorpost, the angel of death passed over the Jewish people, and so they were delivered. We see later in Samuel, one boy, one boy who trusted in God when the whole Israelite army cowered in fear. One boy with a slingshot stood up to a giant named Goliath, and God delivered the people. The pattern, one righteous man, one instrument of wood, God's deliverance from universal judgment for those who will believe and those who will listen. And verse 7 says, Noah became an heir of righteousness. We can believe God for the impossible. We will see his salvation and he will pronounce us righteous because we are trusting in him. And this doesn't mean that Noah lived without sin. It meant that he was an inheritor of righteousness. He was pronounced righteous by a holy God. By believing in God and believing what God said, his faith led God to pronounce him righteous. If we commit a crime and we're standing before a judge about to be sentenced, we could say to the judge, you know, Your Honor, could I just say something? I've been really nice to puppies. I've helped old ladies across the street. I've carried their groceries out to their car. I've done lots of good things. Please pardon me from this crime and this sentence I'm about to serve. And the judge would say, I don't care how many puppies you've been nice to, or even kittens too, or who you've done good deeds for, you've committed this crime, you must serve the sentence. But we can be pardoned. By faith in God, Noah was pardoned and became an heir of righteousness. He inherited the righteousness of a holy God who pronounced him forgiven. Jim was 19, a citizen of Canada. Canada has strict laws 
Jim was in Canada near his home when he saw the blue lights in the rear view mirror. The policeman pulled him over. He said, Jim, I want you to, I want you to walk a straight line. The line kept moving on Jim. He couldn't walk it. The officer told him three times, put your hands behind your back. Jim didn't understand what he meant, so the officer took his arms and put them behind his back and gave him some new jewelry. The DUI had profound implications. He lost his job as a heavy equipment operator. When he married and had children, Canada is strict. He could not drive carpool on field trips or be a chaperone. He was flagged as a risk on a mortgage application and his, his, app, his percentage, his loan rate went up by one half of one percent. He could not work in commercial driving. He could not go to law school. Canada is strict. But he went on, he ra was raising his kids and then he got an amazing word. Queen Elizabeth was extending a pardon to all the nations over which she was the head. This was in 2019. She was exercising what is known as royal privilege, and she was pardoning anyone under her who had had a DUI over 15 years ago and had clean record ever since. Pardoned at the age of 41. Jim was pardoned for what he had done back when he was 19 years old. And Jim writes, and I quote, I can chaperone school trips. I can get the best loan rate now. I have nothing on my record, nothing in my past. I can buy a rifle and go hunting with my friends if I wish to. I can now walk through Canada and hold my head up high because I am pardoned by Queen Elizabeth herself. By order of the Queen, I am set free. Heroes of faith are those ordinary, everyday people. Nobody unusual, except they believe in God, and they believe what he said. They trust him, even when it feels impossible, or they don't understand, or it makes no sense. God has said, trust in my son, you will be pardoned, you will be forgiven, and follow him, listen to him, and I will rebuild your life as surely as I directed Noah to build a great big ark. And when that day comes, and you stand before me, God, you will be an inheritor of righteousness, pardoned by the king, you have trusted in and believed. The example of Noah says to us, trust in God. Trust him when it's impossible. Trust him when it makes no sense. Trust him when you don't know what the next step is. You don't know what's happening. Trust in him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Noah summed up in only a few moments this morning, and there's so much more. But Heavenly Father, help us, we pray, to be like those who have gone before, who when it made no sense or they didn't understand, trusted in you anyway. And Heavenly Father, as we read in Psalm 46, you will be our fortress. You will be the one of whom we say at the end of our life, Come and see the works of the Lord. Thank you for your love and for your grace and for examples you give us. Help us to be true and to follow them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you'll stand and sing with us, please.
Trust in him. He's not going to let you go. Trust in him. He'll show you and I and each of us the way. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours in abundance. Amen.